Thanks everyone for joining us for today's program where we'll be looking at um, ways to improve our sleep and particularly thinking about comfort and positioning. I'm Andrea Salmon, one of the Education and Wellbeing Coordinators here at MS and it is my pleasure to have Sue McCabe with us today. In the spirit of reconciliation, MS Limited acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. As I said, it is my absolute pleasure to have Sue McCabe with us today. Sue is an occupational therapist. We, we both have the same background training, which is really great. And Sue has over 15 years experience working with people specifically to better manage their sleep problems. She's based in WA, so we've got a three hour time difference. We're really pleased that she's with us this morning. And Sue runs a, a, a company called Sleep Links that helps um, really blend the, the understanding of sleep and circadian science with practical everyday strategies and very much applying that to individual situations. So we're really pleased to have you with us today, Sue, and I'm going to click a couple of buttons so that you can share your slides with us. Andrea, <laughs> you thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to present this information which I'm so passionate about real privilege and I'd like to say that I'm presenting I'm on Wajak Noongar country over in Western Australia which is a lovely place to be. So this is I'm going to speak very very quickly because as always I've got too many slides so I'm going to speed through the first ones so that I can spend as much time as possible on the final slides which are the focus for today. So an overview for you very briefly about who am I very briefly about sleep, because I know that you've had other which cover that really well. And today's focus is actually on, specifically on comfort in bed with a focus on thermal comfort and positioning comfort. So very quickly, who am I? I've been an OT for over 40 years. My sleep focus has really now been almost 20 years. Um, and from that, I've been kind of collaborating with other people in Australia and in fact around the world to look at research into practical aspects of sleep for people all ages, with all conditions. And that goes I have to say that there's so much to learn about sleep. It's not, um, even though I'm coming to it with an OT lens, there is so much to learn from every other discipline in the on the planet in terms of sleep, why it matters from all that a psychosocial point of view. So I've had lots to learn and I've been involved in different groups, interest groups, um, connected with sleep specialists, done courses, attended conferences. Very lucky to have got a fellowship in 2007, which led me to meet um, people in the UK, Scotland and Canada, which was very beneficial. Um, and then PhD studies, which kind of fried my brain a little bit, but it was definitely worthwhile in terms of learning a lot more about the research process and particularly about thermoregulation and sleep. So very quickly, sleep is amazing. We could go on about that for a week, about how incredible sleep is. This slide is really just to direct some lovely resources that can help you look at sleep if you would like to. Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, is one of those lovely, easy to read, but very science-based <clears throat> books about sleep, all different aspects of it. Sleep Health Foundation, an Australian site, has lots of information, great up-to-date fact sheets about all aspects of sleep. And then the Centre for Environmental Therapeutics is a beautiful website. Um, it's managed by circadian scientists, so it blends that lovely circadian science which is so important and so fundamental to every aspect of not just our sleep, but also our wakefulness and the rhythms that are so important in that relationship. So that's there for your reference. And of course, we know that sleep matters. And when you look at the science, we can tell that every cell, every system, every thought, action, every relationship is affected by not just how we sleep, but when we sleep, by the patterns and the rhythms of our sleep. So we know it affects management of our physical health, mental health, behaviour, relationships. We know that sleep affects our cognition, memory, learning, participation and performance. 
it's big it's really big and it's yeah it's amazing so this we know that sleep how we sleep really affects us and this this image is one of the few images i've ever actually purchased on license because it just grabbed me so much it just makes me think of me when i haven't had enough sleep and i know it's how my children perceive me when i've not slept well i am just revolting everything just disintegrates with me when i don't sleep but the thing that, too, that we know is so important is how we sleep actually affects everyone around us it's not just about us it's also about everyone else that we're interacting with family work colleagues you know even when we go shopping if we're tired and grumpy the poor old checkout sheet cops it um it's massive so yeah our sleep is really and we know that sleep is a 24-hour concern. It's not just about what happens in the evening and night time. It's about our days and our nights. It's about our rhythms and routines. <clears throat> and our body clock. I'm sure many of you already know about the difference between the larks and the owls. And in fact, there's more than that now that I've been reading about. But um, some of you may be the real larks who just love getting up early, need to get to bed early, and that's how your rhythm works. Other people are night owls and they stay up very, very late and need to sleep in later. And so it's good to be aware of how our own body clocks work, our own chronotype, <clears throat> so that we can work with that rather than try and fight against it all the time. The other thing is that we have clocks in our body. The central clock is in... Um, in our brain near the near the pineal gland but we also have clocks in every other parts of our body our eyes our skin our liver our kidneys our gut all operate as part of the whole body clock system so everything is really integrated and we know that we have sleep stages the things that happen to you when when you sleep can be influenced by different stages of sleep that you're at and the point to make here is that all of us come up into light sleep sleep, and even wake at least a couple of times during the night. And that's an important thing to be aware of when we're thinking about our sleep difficulties and what we need to do to help manage that. With one of the key points being that sleep onset association can make a big difference. Um, so where we, what's in place as we fall asleep at the beginning of the night needs to kind of be still in place when we come up into light sleep or even to little periods of wakefulness so that we can slip back to sleep more easily. So I'm talking about sleep comfort and I'll talk more about that but what our comfort zone is like at the beginning of the night needs to be something that's sustainable so it's readily there for us at other times of light sleep or wakefulness throughout the night. We know that sleep changes with age, so what we need for a good night's sleep can range a lot between individuals. This, and you can see the list here from the Sleep Foundation in 2015. Quite a range, but sleep does change with age. And also what's important to know, which I won't be addressing today, is there are lots and lots of different interventions, things that can make a difference to our sleep. So if you're having difficulty with your sleep, one of the first things to do is actually talk to your doctor, um, talk to your GP, be aware that we need to be especially aware of how we're breathing during sleep. And things like oral appliances, ear, nose and throat surgery, use of CPAP might make a massive difference to how we're sleeping. There's other things too, of course, that can make a big difference. And I will talk a bit more about that as I go through. The main point I really wanna make is that our sleep is all about everything. And this is my little map. It's the map that I work to when I'm working with anybody to look at all the different things that can be affecting their sleep. Um, we look at thermal comfort, sensory comfort, position and movement comfort, social, emotional, the sleep setting, health and medical activities and routines. These are all part of what make a difference to how you're sleeping and how you're functioning during the day. So the thing about sleep is there's so many things that can make a difference and how many of you have seen things pop up maybe on your Facebook or Twitter feeds, the number one sleep tip, this will fix it. Um, and it would be lovely, wouldn't it, if just one thing could make the difference and fix your sleep like we're told it will. But in fact, that's not the case. For all of us, and for particularly if you have a condition like MS, there are so many reasons why you might have sleep problems. 
And here's a list of some of the different reasons that people have reported to me about why um, sleep is a problem for them. I won't read them out to you, but I'll give you a second to read them. You can see I'm going really fast. If you want me to slow down, please write in the comments so that Andrea can tell me that I'm going too fast. Otherwise, I'll speed on through. There's even more reasons, so many different things that can make a difference to how we're sleeping. And this might be a really good point. Oh, actually, no, not quite yet. We'll be touching on quite a few of these things today. The key point is that everyone is different. So we can't be prescriptive and say, this is what you must do to get a good night's sleep or to sleep well, or to get the sleep you need. It's not that prescriptive. And that's why I like to use the word comfort, because comfort means what is just right for you. And look, this might be a good time just to take a little bit of a breath and ask if you would, could write in the comment section just what is you and your sleep. So if you, whether you're here as a person who has MS or a person who works or a family member, in fact, all of us might have different reasons why we get to sleep. Because what's the key concern that you're most aware of? So I'll give you a minute to write that in and Andrew and might feed that to us. Absolutely. For those people who joined us after we got started, that reminder that you're either looking for a question mark icon if you're on a tablet or a Mac type device, but if you're on a laptop or a desktop, you're looking for the control panel, which is usually minimised. So you need to use your little orange box with the white arrow to maximise your control panel, find the heading that says questions and then click on that so you can type in. Let us know. We, we, this is part of the conversation of today. What's your experience? And Sue, I, I think our understanding has also been that um, people with MS are much more likely to experience sleep disturbance. So there's, there yes, are. Indeed. Oh, I love that list you had. That's huge for the reasons why people yeah. might have disturbed yeah. sleep. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anna, and Annalisa oh, has popped in. That she wakes up early and can't get back to no no that's Lynn. Lynn wakes up early and can't get back to sleep. Annalisa has pain and discomfort that wakes her up. Um, Marion's experiences pain when she's asleep and it wakes her up early. Um, Emma's constantly waking during the night as around temperature, being hot or cold, okay. and. Mm. Kerry, Kerry has said she's had MS for 26 years. She learned breathing techniques recently and it's been the best thing ever. She loves her oh, bed brilliant. and it's her favourite place to be. Oh, brilliant. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay. Yara, there's lots of comments coming through, so that's wonderful. So it kind of, it does reflect, doesn't it, the, the huge range of things that can make a difference. And it's a good point for me to time for me to actually say to I'm not sure if I put a slide in about this, but here I am speaking as an OT about how everything, everyone is different and everything matters. And that's a good time for me to make the comment too that it, that for really good um, help with sleep, often you need the diverse team. I've worked with type people where sometimes actually it's the dietitian who can make all the difference to how someone's sleeping or the clinical nurse specialist, or it might be the GP, or it might be the clean psych, it might be the physio. Often it might be a combination of us all working together to look at um, what factors are that are important and, and making sure we're all on the same page in terms of the information and support that we provide. So everyone's different and the team. So let's zoom on a bit more. So today's focus thing is about comfort. I'm hoping that my go through this, it may actually help with some um, tips around what happens when you wake up early, pain and discomfort, um, that whole idea of constantly waking, I wonder why that's happening, and also even looking at how something like the breathing techniques can make such a difference to someone's comfort and the ability to get back to sleep when they do wake. In my mind means what's just right for you right now. So we've got lots of sites there telling us all the things that can make a difference. 
but because you, everyone is different and we're different from each other, but we're also different from ourselves, what we need varies from seasons, from day to day, depends on what's going on in our lives. Um, so comfort means having that flexibility to, to see the whole picture and know what we need and when we need it to get the best um, support and conditions for good sleep. So I'm going to zoom through some, you know, I talked about those, um, I'll go back to my map just to remind you. I love my map. That's what keeps me focused when I'm talking to people about their sleep. So I'm going to zoom through a different kind of domains of comfort, but I'm going to then linger on thermal comfort and position and movement comfort because that's the brief today for what the focus is. So back again, here we know that health and medical comfort is huge. There's so much going on around effects of medication, time in the dose, effects of management of pain, effects of having hospitalisation, procedures, surgery, appointments, and therapies. Also, it's really important to be aware that there are specific sleep conditions that could be having an impact on your sleep. It may be associated specifically with your condition with MS, but it might be around other things in particular Think about, and it's not time for me today to focus on, but many people I see have restless leg syndrome that hasn't been identified. Breathing, breathing during sleep is a really big one. I think for all of us, if we wake up feeling tired, even if we slept for hours and hours and hours and feel like we've had a good sleep, if we wake up feeling tired, always talk to your GP about can we check what's happening with my breathing during sleep. So, so many of us can have sleep disorder breathing and that really, how we breathe during sleep underpins everything else. But so many things listed there as well. In terms of rhythms and routines, again, we could spend a whole day talking about the impact of um, the timing of our meals and snacks and drinks. The fact that you might have occupational commitments and by occupational, I mean household, going out to work, other family and caregiving responsibilities. So you don't always have optimal control over how you manage your days and your routines. From this slide, the main thing I guess I would point out that as a take home message was, one, if I had to suggest one good thing for sleep and our circadian rhythms is try to get a really good dose of morning outdoor light. That's been shown to be one of the key things that sets our body clock. If we get good morning light, if we have trouble getting to sleep in the evening, then that can make all the difference. If you find you fall asleep too early, actually after, a dose of afternoon light might be what you need to help push your body clock back. So that's just the very key quick message from there from rhythms and routines. Of course, social emotional comfort is massive. There's so many things that go on for all of us in day-to-day -day life and I've just listed some of the things here that we need to think about, address, get support for. And again, that's not the focus of today's session, but I can't, can't not mention the fact that that's a really big one and, and we need to look at, at the whole social emotional comfort when we're looking at sleep. The sleep setting is huge. In fact, the sleep setting, all these things actually feed into position and movement and thermal comfort. Just flicking back in a way to social emotional comfort, if we're feeling highly anxious, very stressed or distressed, we will feel hot and sweaty. People will tell us you just need to chill. There's, everything feeds into each other. And it's the same with our sleep setting, where our, our bedroom is located, having um, being able to sleep hopefully in a dark setting can make a huge difference to the rhythms of our body temperature change, our ability to be calm and settled. Having said that, if you feel anxious in the dark, then you might need soft ambient light somewhere to feel more comfortable. If you need to get up and go to the toilet during the night, how do you have the room as dark as possible but still be safe? There's lots of things that can make a difference in your sleep setting and I'll focus on those a bit more when I talk about thermal comfort and also when I talk about um, position and movement comfort. And then sensory comfort's another big one. We know that there's so many different things that can have a calming effect to help us feel more calm and settled um, in readiness for sleep. And we know that are things that can make us feel more alert and ready for action to start the day. There's things that can make us feel agitated, 
So the more we get to know what sensory um, inputs or experiences if affect us and how and when they affect us, the more we are able to take control of that and manage that well. And the other thing to point out here is again, not only are we all different to each other, can all be very different to ourselves from time to time. So I've got the image of my beautiful little cat, Tisky here. There are times when having my blue mohair rug is the greatest source of comfort for me when I'm restless, agitated and can't sleep. And having Tisky on the bed can be incredibly calming and part of that whole sense of feeling calm and relaxed and ready for sleep. But there are other times when Tisky is just pesky, the last thing I need when I need to be calm. And so I need into what I need and when I need it and how that can vary from time to time. So many things can make a difference. Um, there's more and more evidence emerging about the effects of aromas, different aroma um, smells in particular, the um, lavender, valerian, things like that that can make a difference to our ability to get to sleep and stay asleep. So heaps of things to explore. Now I'm going to focus and slow down a bit. I'm focusing today on thermal comfort and movement and position. Now the thing to do with thermal comfort is that in fact body temperature regulation and sleep and wakefulness are really um, explicitly, in, intrinsically linked to each other. In fact, the part of our brain that controls the rhythms, rhythms of our sleep and wake is also the same part of our brain that controls the rhythms of body temperature change. And both of these are really impacted by the rhythms of light and dark. But the thing to know is that we have daily rhythms of core body temperature are essential to be able to get to sleep and stay asleep and I'm sure you will probably know that that as we approach sleep our core body temperature starts to drop and we need our body temperature to be kind of cool and lower than it is during the day and the normal circadian pattern drops 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 and towards morning wake our core body temperature rises. The thing that I didn't know until I started my study was that the essential mechanism to that actually our distal skin temperature. So the, the rhythms of temperature of in particular our hands and feet but also our ears and other distal skin parts but especially feet are a really mechanism for that whole part of our sleep temperature rhythms. This isn't new. Once This is what I love about, about research and, and um, crossing the boundaries in science. Once I went into physiological science, I realised that you know, Kurt Crouchy, 20, over 20 years, 21 years ago, was researching and talking about the fact that we need distal vasodilation. So those tiny little kind of, they're called arteriovenous anastomoses. So our circulatory system needs to expand as we go before sleep, in the hour before sleep, it dilates, and that's what allows our body to lose heat. And with different studies that have been shown that in fact this is the strongest predictor of how ready our body is to fall asleep. So studies have been done with little premature babies, I did a study with school aged children, it's been done with young adults, with athletes, with elderly people, people with dementia. Everybody has these patterns of, of um, body temperature change and in particular in the hour before sleep onset we see this rapid rise in our distal skin temperature. So effectively we really need to have warm hands feet to sleep. So in terms of thermal comfort then, what makes a difference to that? Getting those warm hands and feet, what do we need for all that to happen? And there's so many things that make a difference and again I love this because it explains that what, what we do for sleep and it fits in with the circadian science is not just about us and our body but it's what we do when we do it it's about our environment and how we're interacting with our environment so a type and type the timing and type of our daily exercise and our evening exercise can make a big difference to our body temperature regulation our patterns of temperature change the type and type of the bath and shower can make a big difference so quite a few studies have shown that 
it can be really beneficial to have a warm or tepid bath or shower in the hour before sleep time. <clears throat> now, again, I, most many people I know say that that's what they love to do. That feeling, feeling clean and fresh and cool as you slip into bed can be a really good feeling. For some people, having a bath or a shower can be quite effortful and actually them feel stressed or just distra distressed or it's not so easy so that's when you'd work with your team so okay if I can't have a bath or shower in the hour before bedtime what can I do instead that gives me that same kind of distal warmth that I need same with type and time timing of our food our drink and our medications we know that having say you all we'll know about the effects of caffeine and um, how having caffeine too close to can make a difference. It actually affects our, our thermal comfort as well. Hot spicy foods, icy cold foods, um, rich, very rich um, foods can also make a difference to how our gut is functioning which will have an impact on our thermal comfort. The timing and the type of light as I've already mentioned actually impacts on those patterns of rhythms of our body cooling down to so we know that as we approach sleep time, the um, even just anticipating sleep, expecting, knowing that it's time for sleep is part of that whole cue of our body starting to adjust and change, our heart rate changes, our pulse changes. When we lay down, that has an effect as well. So it's this lovely kind of symphony and cascade of changes that make a difference to our body temperature change. All these things playing together to affect our thermal regulation. The way we, we position ourselves, the way we move during sleep can also have an impact. So, for example, if you're really cold, you might need to, to squeeze up close to kind of preserve your body heat. Really hot temperature, you might want to open your body right out and sleep open. And that's fine, it's easy, but if you've got a movement impairment or have got less control over your movements, what happens then? So we'll talk about that as well. And of course, sleep companions can make a big difference to our thermoregulation. So there's lots of factors that we need to look at, think about, see how we can make a difference. So here's a few hints that might make a difference. So we know that if you have high intensity exercise close to bedtime, it can raise your core body temperature, make it hard to cool down in readiness for sleep. We know that having a warm or tepid bath in the hour before bedtime can make a big difference. We should avoid very hot or very cold drinks in the hour before bedtime. Be aware of the effects of spicy or rich evening meals. We've, I've talked already about the importance of having regular morning outdoor or bright light. I might just use that um, to show you another thing that if I've, I've worked with some people who, due to their pain or movement impairment, say, look, I'd love to get out every morning and sit in the garden for or bright light that my circadian system needs, you know, but because of my movement impairment or my pain, I actually just can't get out of bed first thing in the morning. Or it might be that there's family or work reasons why you can't get out. But some of you may be aware of these lovely retimer glasses. There's a few different types out there, but the ones I've got were designed by um, a, a, a group of researchers at the Uni, Uni of South Australia. These are called retimer glasses. So if you're finding that you have trouble getting to sleep at the, um, so it's been actually longer to fall asleep, you might find that having half an hour to an hour of getting that blue green spectrum light in the morning can be enough to help with your circadian rhythms and it doesn't help just with sleepiness but it helps with your rhythms of body temperature change so i'm just waving those around um, i bought some so i can lend them to people for trial i'm a real fan of trying everything because as i keep saying not everything works for everyone but there's something that's worth knowing about the other thing to help with your body temperature is try and dim your lights before bedtime as you can, as much as you can. Have your bedroom as, bedroom as dark as possible during sleep time. And also if you're finding you get really hot and sweaty during sleep, talk about the medications that you're taking, the type and the timing. Discuss with your GP because different medications have different effects on your cardiovascular system, 
uh, your heart, your heart rate, and that all ties into your body temperature regulation. It's more it's about your thermal comfort. So science tells us that the ideal bedroom temperature is around 18 to 19 degrees. So um, we're, we all have different seasons, we all have been different climates, but if we can aim to manage our bedrooms, have that cooler room all year round, that can make a difference. Having said that, I have worked with some people who are perhaps very frail or who um, have got very low body weight, or I've worked with little tiny babies where, in fact, that lower so even though the standard rule is have your bedroom cool, it's not necessarily the rule for everyone. And there's practical ways to manage the sh where your bedroom is located. If your bedroom has a west-facing window so it gets masses of afternoon sunlight, what could you do to try and create some shade so the room doesn't heat up so much in the afternoons? You might look at lockout blinds. You windows which doesn't have to necessarily be super expensive there's companies now that provide kind of um, opt-in double glazing where it's not like the traditional kind that can make a difference I've worked with families who say look I'm in a room with this in place sometimes even just a big giant pot plant outside that window can make a difference for shade. so lots of things to make a difference we know that fans are beautiful great effects from fans in terms of the, the airflow across your skin, the sound of the fan, some people love the white noise that comes from the ticking sound of the fan, but also from a cooling effect, the airflow across your skin can create that kind of cooling effect on your skin. Having said that, I know some people who hate it, so I've mentioned here the close comfort system, which is a direct cooling system, which um, works really well. It's not an air conditioner, so it doesn't cool the whole room down, but it's relatively cheap. It's around $500 for the system, which is, pardon me, for some people is not cheap, but it's certainly not as expensive as getting the whole air conditioning system put into the house. The good thing about it is it uses very, very little power. Direct it so it, it directs the cool air exactly where you want it to be. So I've got one that I lend to the clients that I work with, and in summer I use it myself sometimes, and I can direct cool onto me, air onto me, not just when I'm sleeping but also when I'm working. So there's lots of things to help manage your thermal comfort. That's even more hint. So when, as well as thinking about your your kind of the climate, your, your bedroom climate, we also need to think about the microclimate of your actual bed. So it tends to be that the bed climate, how hot it is in your bed, is around 30 to 32 degrees. So we call this the microclimate. So some practical things to think about here are to avoid those really soft immersive mattresses. So some people will talk about and recommend we love temper foam, but in fact, the more you sink into a mattress, the more your body's encompassed by that kind of material, the harder it is to regulate your body temperature. Avoid synthetic materials, except that more and more there are materials being produced that are synthetic that have thermoregulation properties, such as embedded is not a natural material but seems to have a cooling property. We can use thermal comfort overlays and they can be as low tech as just, uh, and I should wave this around to you now, um, uh, low tech such as this kind of vented overlay that I'm waving to you at the moment. This vented air, air blah, overlay comes from a company in Western Australia called Pelican Manufacturing and it's actually very spongy porous kind of foam, it's washable, and it's covered in that kind of sports, you know, that stretchy basketball wicking material. Um, so not everybody, I always get things to lend to people to trial first, but I have lent this to many people who find that sleeping on this actually gives them a bit of um, comfort in terms of, you know, if you've got kind of sensitive, you know, painful hip or feeling a bit bony and sensitive, 
This provides a little bit of a comfort layer, but it also provides a thermal comfort layer. And I have to say, I actually use this myself in summer. It just seems to have, help me feel less hot when I'm laying directly on my mattress. But there are other low-tech overlays you can use. So you're probably aware of the, the, um, the impact of natural wool and how that can actually provide cooling, warming properties in winter and cooling properties in summer. And there's been studies that have shown, that it was a study I think of middle-aged women with fibromyalgia using natural wool as an overlay and for clothing and how that impacted on their ability to get. This one I'm showing you here is also from, I buy it by the meter from Pelican Manufacturing. What I like about this is it's natural fleece, but it's actually on a woven um, backing, so it's machine washable. You know, if you buy fleece that is on um, the higher, but really thinking about it, any bedding shop has has worn bedding that might make a difference. Um, so there's lots of low tech um, stuff that you can get. Equally, there's high tech stuff. In the next couple of slides, I'll be showing you those, and I'll also show you thermo balancing bedding. Which, um, I'll show you in my next slide as well. And there's wicking bedding. You, if, if, if your issue is more around the fact that you just get really hot, you might want material that actually just absorbs that moisture and wicks it away from your body. So lots of different kinds of things to make, help you manage your bed microclimate. So what oh, was the go. name of the overlay? Um, overlay is, here's the next slide and I realise this is here. So the one I'm showing you right now is the vented overlay pad from Pelican Manufacturing. But as I said, everyone is so different. I've also used with great success um, Supracore S. There's a um, particular kind of material that we often use when we're doing seating, um, special wheelchair lining. So you'd need to go to an equipment supplier for that. But I like that because it's machine washable, um, but it only comes in sheets. Well, actually, you can buy mattresses made of it, but they're really, really heavy. They'd be impossible to wash and they're very expensive. But for some people, they only come in sheets that are 600 by 600. But for some people, that's been just right to lie on to help give them a bit of a kind of airflow and a sense of comfort. You can also get sonar thermal regulation bedding, which is on this slide here. And that's the bedding I used in my research. And that's made with active phase change material. So it's special kind of, actually I can wave it at you. This is what one way it looks. So it's soft and flexible, but it's got this kind of little waxy particles that when you're too hot, it absorbs body heat and helps regulate it and bring it down. But it also helps you when you're too cold, kind of gives the heat back. So a lot of people say, look, the problem is it's not just that I'm too hot and I'm just going to throw off my rugs and sleep with a fan on all night long. The problem is that at two o'clock in the morning, I'm freezing, it's really, really cold. So what can I do? And that's why sometimes we do need quilts and overlays so that we can balance those kind of fluctuations during the night. Some people say that now electric blankets or electric throws, especially if they're washable, uh, are way better than the olden days when you'd switch them on and just get totally hot and be quite dangerous. You can get blankets and throws now that have got timers on them and they also have different zones. So you might just want to have the feet area of your um, electric blanket that's warming up but not the whole area. There's the HydroSense overlay which um, I don't have a picture of here. I'm just moving into high tech now. It's through a company called iCare, and um, I've got one that they provided to me that I can link to clients and to trial first. And that's where you've got an overlay that has got tiny little bits of water rowing, running through it, and you it's got attached to a little water pump, and you can set the temperature of the water from as really low as you know 20 or lower degrees to warmer, so that you. Surface that you're managing the, the 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 sense of coolness or warmth of. Um, there's also another type of that called chili pad technology, which is not available in Australia. Suppliers not in Australia, but they're in America. But they do say that they have a hundred day money back return. So if you wanted to trial that, you might possibly purchase it, knowing that if it doesn't work for you, you should be able to send it back. The chili pad. 
just comes as a single um, piece. The chili pad can come, I think, where you can actually get double queen size and you can operate the two. Oh, there it is, a picture here. So you can operate the two different areas. So chili technology is something that's worth looking into. I've talked about natural fleece. Uniqlo, you know that clothing shop, Japanese clothing shop, they now have airism padding, which could make a difference. There's a company called Nikki G's, which sells bedding made with that um, outlast thermobalancing material. And some people swear by just the use of wheat packs or gel pads or hot water bottles, heat it up first, put into the into the foot of your bed. So you get those warm feet that you need to sleep on set. Um, I really want to emphasize though, but everything like this. Safety is a big thing. If some of us might have sensory impairment, so we can't feel if something's too hot, when we're really fast asleep, we won't necessarily know that something is, is too hot or too cold. Um, so we really need to be quite careful when we're trialing new things. So trial first if you can. And then I've just put in orange because it won't be on your notes. It, only this morning I remembered that I left out in my overlays and bedding one of my favourites, which is the Symmetry Sleep Cool Over Sheet. So Symmetry Sleep is a company from the UK that makes positioning equipment. I'll show you some of that in a minute. And they make this soft sheet that's made with what they call cool over material. And the thing about this is it's quite soft, it's wicking, um, it's a little bit stretchy. So if, if pressure management is an issue for you and you need to be on a, on a mattress that has good pressure relieving properties, this might be the kind of sheet or overlay that works for you. Um, people who feel quite tender and have lots of pain often report that this seems to feel nice and gentle, um, a lovely thing to use. So there's lots and lots of choices in terms of managing your your bed, the microclimate of your of your temporary camp. There's more heat um, hints though. We're talking about is warm extremities for sleep onset and maintenance. So slippers, Ugg boots and socks before bedtime, of course, can make a difference. Many of us, most of us, tend to not have carpet in our houses in Australia, floorboards, tiles, um, etc. And I think now that I know about warm feet, I'm so much more aware of how ridiculously cold my floorboards are, not just in winter, but even now in the change of seasons, I'm realising that in fact, I tend to need socks still, even though we're in November, before bedtime, because my feet just get icy cold. When I get up to go to the loo at three in the morning, um, my feet get, can get really, really cold. So you think about what that might work for you. Having said that, we know that we need to be aware of safety. So we might be looking at getting socks that have got those non-slip little um, things underneath them. Think about floor coverings, but again, safety. So mats and carpets can be beautiful in terms of giving us the warmth that we need under our feet. But if they're a trip hazard, it's not so good. Um, you can actually get electrically heated, rechargeable socks or insoles. You hear of the Zaki wireless USB battery heated insoles. And I think motorcycle, they're, they're bought mainly on motorcycle um, stores. So people who are out cycling in really cold weather might use them um, and I'm aware of people a therapist in Tasmania put me onto these she has people in Tasmania with MS who swear by these kind of electrically heated um, insoles or socks you can get hats and beanies maybe even having a big difference heated throws and heat packs and water bottles as I've already mentioned so lots of hints there to, that can make a difference so I'm just it's me kind of throwing lots of things at you about thermal comfort. Are there any questions before I move into positioning and movement comfort? Oh, I feel like I just go on and on and on so much. I'm aware well, I've got there, there's things. been some great comments coming in about uh, people finding they wear a beanie at in at night yes. and that helps them. Yeah. Um, can I have a? Can you just tell us again the name of those glasses that you showed us before? Yes, sure. Um, the, the, there's actually quite a few different types around, but the ones that I've got here are called re-timer glasses. So re you can go on to the re-timer. So they're an Australian company. Um, you can go on to their, once, once you've looked them up on um, 
bottom, bottom up, they'll then pop up on your Facebook feed. <laughs> and then you'll probably <laughs> get a little thing that says, <laughs> of course they will. But then, when that, when that happens, if you go there, you go, oh, there's a 10% discount. So they're actually, in, to my mind, for what they do, I feel like they're relatively low cost. Except and that if they do don't work people for you, get these sense. things funded through their NDIS package? I would say yes. I mean, we know that there's a whole low cost, low risk yep. um, aspect that we need to be aware of. So, look, these, in a way, could be high risk if you use them incorrectly. So if someone suffers from migraines or possibly even if you have epilepsy or if you get the timing wrong, if you use them for too long or at the wrong time of day, they might actually be not effective and may even be damaging. So you need to use them with caution. In fact, the, the, the scientists who develop these are medical or sleep physiologists, so they include those precautions there. So I would say if you're in WA and if you were a client of mine, I would be lending you these first to trial them because I hate people buying anything because every, there is nothing that works 100% for everybody, I've found. Absolutely. Everyone is yeah. so different. So, so yeah. my whole my whole is around trying to have as much to people first, but that's not always practical or hygienic or feasible. But I would say these, I, I like these because I think they're quite high tech, but in the scheme of things, they're low risk. And you can, and you you find can them actually effective? have one. Yes, I recently, I lent them to trial and just recently I lent them to a woman who has um, severe um, fibromyalgia with lots and lots of pain, which means that she has trouble getting out of bed and spends a lot of time in bed during the day, which then means that she has trouble getting to sleep in the evening mm. and it's a vicious yeah. cycle. And she um, trialled them and she said, look, sometimes you need to take a bit of time, but within a week she said she could feel the difference. So she That's couldn't right. get out to get that morning sunlight she needed. So she, it was lovely. She said in the morning she has to stay in bed for an hour before she can get a body moving to get up. But her husband brings her in a coffee. Um, she sits up, she opens the blind, and she puts her retimer glasses on. And that's like she's saying to her whole body, every cell in her body, come on, guys, it's day shift now. And she gets that lovely circadian pattern started. And that has a knock-on effect then to everything, including her sleep, including her pain. So, Absolutely. yeah. I, so with the, <laughs> with, the, um, with the increase in telehealth over the time of COVID, do you only see people in WA or are you able to see people who are in the eastern states? Yes, I have seen people from um, other other states, for sure, with telehealth. I prefer to do that if if I know that I that the people in other states do already have um, service providers that they're working with, because yeah. I feel like often there's a lot of background stuff going on, um, big picture stuff, other parts of support that need to be kind of integrated, coordinated. Kind of, and I yeah. Hate, yeah, I hate being like this random person who just comes out of nowhere, throws in advice and then leaves again. So if that's I can link yeah. in with the supporting team, that's definitely my that's preference. Great. Yeah. And Chiara okay, has just I, thrown in the comments that she's found an online shop called Sleep Solutions and you can actually yes. make your purchases using your NDIS funding straight from them. So that thanks, Chiara, for yes. that. That's great. Yes, yeah, that's I, that's fantastic. I'm glad you mentioned that because I have come across that and I can see they have a whole range of stuff. I think they actually might be linked to a CPAP supplier, perhaps. perhaps. Right. Maybe Respironics or Philip. Yeah, I remember looking at that. Um, look, whenever impossible, where the impossible, wherever possible, um, if you can work with your clinician to trial things, I really recommend it. Um, Absolutely. Because by the time you pay for the hours of a clinical providing support, that's money that's kind of coming out of your funds. But depending on the cost and also the safety of any items, it is money worth spending. It's worth spending the time to trial things, to get feedback, to use that clinical reasoning, to get what's just right for you, rather than wasting your money on stuff that doesn't work for you. Uh, mm. At the very worst, it's just stuck in a cupboard forever. At the very 
or very, to the very worst, it could actually be completely wrong and cause damage. So I'm kind of a bit of a fan of, of working together as much as you can. But I realise it's not always practical. And I realise that sometimes people can just get overwhelmed with all the clinicians and experts oh. in their lives. Like teams are lovely and I love being part of a team. But when you stop and ask somebody how many appointments they have in a week, you go, oh, my goodness, I didn't realise there's so much going on. So everything is a double-edged sword. I've only got 10 Thank minutes you. and I'm going to try and move, yeah. and move. Let's move on. Thanks, yeah, too. <laughs> I've told Andrew that she has to kick me off on the dot because I've actually got an appointment with my 19-year-old mum and I don't want to be late for her. So Andrew is going to kick me off on the dot of 10, so I'll move on quickly. Here we go. I'm moving through to position and movement comfort. This is massive. We could spend a whole day exploring this because the, the position that you lie in is absolutely comfort, which, of course, has an impact on your sleep. But again, as I said before, comfort is all about everything. It's about your breathing. The position you lie has a huge impact on how you're breathing during sleep and your swallowing. Some people with conditions like MS have difficulty managing their saliva and swallowing, even coughing um, as they need to. The position you lie in can make a huge difference for that. Managing reflux, managing skin pressure care, managing your temperature regulation, managing pain, the way you can move independently or move with assistance in and out of bed and within bed, your safety and your actual quality of sleep are all affected by your the way the position that you're in and the way that you the help that you have to move or what you need to be able to move. So it's really big, it's really huge, it all links in with each other. But the things that we can think about here again, and I'll go through really quickly, is how you set up your about your bed, your mattress, your bedding. Do you or don't you use side rails? What are the pillows and cushions you use? And is there special supporting equipment that might make a difference? So apologies for going too fast, but very quickly, sometimes you might just need a second set of eyes to say, oh, a minute, what if we move the bed around? So this image that you can see on your slide now is actually one that I drew up with a man who has MS, who always likes to sleep on the side of his bed. And you can see that because of the way his bed was configured, he would get out of bed, walk down the side, around the end of the bed to get to the door to go to the toilet during the night. And just a new set of eyes, I was able to say, hey, hang on a minute, could we just swing your bed around, move your drawers to the other end? Look at the difference it makes in terms of getting out and how far you have to work walk to get from the edge of the bed you like to be on your left side of the bed to the door just the setup of the of your bedroom might be something could make a difference to how you the position you lie in whether you're facing the wall facing the door facing the window how close you are to the toilet all those things so think about how your bedroom is set up and what could make a difference the bed is huge we can think about the height of your bed the width do you or don't you have side rails do you or don't you need head and footballs? What difference do they make? Or it might even be as high tech as do you, what you benefit from having a bed that actually automatically turns from side to side to shift your body weight to help manage your comfort and positioning. So there's lots of things that can make a difference and it depends on the um, movement limitations or the abilities that you have um, that make a difference to what you need. So, for example, if you need to sleep in bed with your two dogs, you might need a, a, a really wide, wide bed. But some people say, actually, I find it much better if I just have a single or a king single bed because then I've got the choice to get out from either side, depending on how I'm feeling. My mobility is much more enhanced by having a narrower bed. It might be that I need to pull on side rails to actually help with my mobility and having a narrower bed, single or king single, means that I can reach both sides to pull on the rails. So the width and the height can make a big difference. You might need just the height of your bed to or you might need some technology and have an adjustable height bed depending on how you're moving, what, what you're doing. So. There's so many things that need to be in place that make a difference. You might decide that you want side rails on your bed that just grab hold on to, to grab onto to help you move. But for some people, side rails can actually be quite risky. There's a risk of getting your hands or legs or head caught in the side rails. So we need to think about the safety. Some people don't want any 
and that they're really important because it helps you position your, your pillows or your foot wedges or things like that to help you manage your comfort and your positioning. So just a little bit about adjustable beds. Again, we could, I'm so apologising, we could spend a whole day on this. Many people do benefit from having a bed that can be electrically adjustable. But it's not everything. So sometimes I'm getting referrals now where people say, I can't stay, I want an adjustable bed. And I find that actually sometimes really, really frustrating because sometimes it is ex it's actually not the bed that's making the difference. So we can't pin all of our sleep quality on having a bed that will do that. Having said that, it can make a big difference. As I've mentioned at height, sometimes just being able to raise the head section of your bed or raise the, the, your legs can make a huge difference to your comfort on your back. We know that when you're lying on your back and your breathing will be improved if you have a little bit of head raise. But then if you want to lie on your side, if you've got that kind of side wedge sticking up, it will turn you into a bit of a banana. So you might want to make your bed completely flat. If you get a bed that has tilt function, which is also known as Trendelenburg, auto, um, reverse Trendelenburg, it means that you can actually get your food you can even tilt the whole bed back. Can you see the picture I've got here, the second one, that image, where the person's head and legs are still higher than their hips. So it's good, a good position for them in terms of breathing. It's a good position in terms of, say, if your legs, get your feet get swollen and you need elevation of your legs. But if you sometimes when you raise the head of your bed, it causes you to slide down the bed, and that can be tricky. But by tilting the whole bed backwards, you can so there's lots and lots of things that make a difference. Some beds have a function called auto-retraction, which means that as you raise the head of your bed up, the actual head section slides out a bit too, so you're not getting squished so much. It can make a big difference to people who are spending a lot of time in bed in that upright position. So that's where I'd recommend that you work with a clinician to help you look at all these features to work out what's best also, there's considerations about the width of the bed. If you get a completely full, say, queen-size bed, but you want one that has functionality when you're raising and lowering, how does that impact on your partner when you want the head up but they don't? How does it impact on you with caregiving when you might want to better get out on both sides of the bed? You might decide that you need to get a split or companion kind of bed that gives you more choices about how the bed works for you. Even simple things like whether that lighting on them might make a difference. You can even get beds now that um, adjust by using voice where you can say head up, legs up, head down, legs down. That's fairly new technology. I think it's still a little bit glitchy, but there's so many options there that might be important or relevant for you. There's lots to think about. We also need to think about your mattress. Same thing. Everybody different how soft, how firm, whether you have a comfort layer, having firm edges. So if you look at a person who sits on the edge of your bed, it's really important to get a mattress that's got those very nice firm edges so that you're safe, secure, not likely to slide off the edge of the bed when you're trying to sit on the edge of your bed before you get up to stand. You can get beds that have got gel infused in the top layer to help keep you cool. Some people love mat latex mattresses, others prefer foam. There's different types of foam, different densities. So there's so many things, different types of springs. Sometimes you can get beds that have got foam in the springs. Sometimes you can get beds which have got a layer of air over the foam. Others you can get layers of air inside the foam. Sometimes you can get beds that have got static air where they're layers of air, but they're not pumping or alternating. You can get alternating air. So the, the range of different mattresses is, it feels like it's almost infinite. Not quite, but feels that way. Unequivocally to anybody, and I've learned it myself the hard way, if you can trial a mattress first for several nights, please, please, please do. It's so easy to get the wrong mattress. And if you go to store and lie on the bed and try on a mattress and even if you can lie there for half an hour but it's the middle of the afternoon and your body's achy and tired often mattress this is what happened to me I bought a really expensive mattress 
five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, I was tired and achy. I lay on a particular kind of mattress and went, oh my God, that's amazing. I've got to have it. Lots of money. And within two weeks, I knew it was the wrong one. It was like a sink well. I sunk into it, couldn't get out, couldn't return it. So if you're looking at mattresses, definitely talk to the store or your clinician about can you buy it. So I'm conscious of the time. time. Oh my God, yes, I'm going to speed through though. This, this always happens. There are so many choices for bedding. So you've got them listed here. They all make a difference. Different kinds of bedding with different properties. Some of the things I've put here on the site, I've said, I've given you links to different types of bedding that can help make a difference with how you move and turn. So the top three, the, the Wonder Sheet, the Wendy Let, and Comfort Linen are all different types of beds that help make it easier for you to slide. Uh, Protect Bed is a really nice brand of, of moisture proof bedding. Microcloud is a brand of quilts and that um, very lightweight quilts that can make a difference. And then thermal balancing bedding I've already talked about. And finally, I'm going to talk very quickly about different kinds of positioning comfort. The different kinds of, um, I am going to go five minutes over if that's okay. Shall that's I? fine. Absolutely. If so, you can do yeah. that, that's lovely. Um, um, and take it to the appointment so I'm just going to drive straight there so okay different kinds of things you can get different cushions you can get solid foam chip foam you can get micro fill I'm going to quickly wave these around at you and again the whole point being everything is different everyone is different so you might need to think about your options for trialing them so I'm waving in front of you just a small roll cushion which is a symmetric cushion it's covered in moisture proof but very strong flexible covering so it won't dig in or make you uncomfortable it's filled with chips of low resilience foam so for me as a therapist when I'm doing it and it comes in all sizes big giant cushions horseshoe cushions it comes with the pull over material covers so when people have got need positioning support and and if they're at risk of pressure injury or pain I love these they're really expensive but they're really good because you can really make them work well for people Equally though, Pelican Manufacturing in Perth, um, and I think it's just look up Pelican Manufacturing, they make a whole range of different um, cushions, which again have got the moisture proof cover, they've got zip so you can add or remove filling, they've got the fibre filling, and then they also make washable, soft washable stretchy covers. The good thing about Pelican is you can with your clinician, you could find out exactly what shape and size of cushion you need and you could ask them to customise it to be exactly the size you need. So I do that a lot with Pelican. I also use just simple foam wedges a lot from Pelican and I'm waving an odd shaped one around here. So often you might just, you can, can you see in the top slide, I've just put a, a wedge under the fitted sheet so that for this person who finds they just slide to the edge of their bed and Find themselves falling out that little low wedge is just enough to help keep them comfortably they're sliding out but it doesn't stop them from getting in and out when they need to in the morning so you can get high high wedges low wedges short long angled they're soft they're, they're um, wipeable they can go under your fitted sheet they're fantastic this is one of my favorite tools it's a sensory comfort as well some people if they're restless and move about a lot and put these under their sheet and create like a little cocoon that they lie in that helps with comfort. So they have different ones like that. And let me show you another kind of positioning comfort. This is a company in Queensland called Sleep and Rest. They come with beautiful, soft, stretchy covers. They've got a moisture proof cover, which is soft and stretchy. But then inside them is the, the layer that holds, actually holds buckwheat husks. So these cushions come in a whole range of shapes and sizes. They're not cheap, but what I like about these is that they're a bit heavier and denser. So if you need something that's a bit kind of more solid that you can rest against, you know, when you're lying on the side, for example, and you want it behind you to stop you rolling backwards, these might be the go. So that I really like these as well. The only thing about things like these, if they're filled with beads or buckwheat, they might be noisy. Some people love it, some people hate it. So again, there's so many features about positioning and movement and cushions that need to be considered that can make a difference. 
only their hiss and pitch of all the different choices. His four, Escalade, Sleep and Rest, Symmetra Sleep and Pelican, are the ones that I mainly use, and that's because they're available for trial. In particular, Pelican I love because you can get them customised to suit you in terms of shape and size exactly. Um, and here we go, another little example of what's been made exactly to suit Ed. See how his legs and hips time he's getting hip and knee pain so I got from again from Pelican this knee support wedge made to exactly suit him actually that example is just my trial one it doesn't quite suit him I need to make it a bit longer and finally why am I moving here's a few more ideas of practical items that might make a difference for you um, so again you need to explore them with your clinicians Ed, body comforter which is from Pelican Manufacturing. He's got a long sleep and rest the, the maroon cushion beside him. So lots of different things that can make a big difference. Finally safety, we need to think about clutter, group hazards, about seeing your way during the night, be careful of overheating, be careful about pressure and shearing injuries because of the way you move, the positions you're in. We need to think about dehydration, be quite a risk for people if they have an impairment and maybe not perhaps avoiding drinking too much because they're worried about getting up to the toilet at night. If you use um, cushions, rails, or if you have gaps in your mattress, be, just be aware of the risk of moving and getting caught in those gaps. And my final thing is about breathing. Always think about your breathing. If you're waking up tired, talk to you about and then they finish. Um, my web my email address is um, mailed if you've got any questions. I'm so sorry that I'm having to fly through it like this. No, look, Sue, we knew that there would be much more information that we wanted to share. We talked about that when we met prior to today. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. look, it, it, what you've done today for us has been fantastic because what it's done is highlighted that, A, there's not one size fits all, but the, the flip side of that is there are so many solutions to the individual yeah. issues that people are experiencing. And, it, it, you know, it, whilst while one person might find that a bit um, discouraging, I find that super encouraging because it's that whole thing about ask the question, raise it. Don't yep. feel that you have to just suffer in silence and this is how I am. Exactly. Ask yep. your team, get them on board with coming up with solutions. And I loved also, Sue, that concept that you would be willing to work with people remotely, so like with their team based here in Victoria or New South Wales, ACT or Tassie, but you could be that adjunct that brings in the sleep expertise. And I think that's just fabulous. Thank you so much, so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a real privilege. I, being, being part of a team is everything to me. And, and, and as a sole practitioner, in fact, I can more readily be part of a team. But I think we only get things right if we do look at the whole picture, look at everything, the context of people's environment, their life, their lives, their families, um, and think about what everyone in the team can offer so that it really comes together um, exactly yep. the right way. So there are, lots ever, of thank yous coming through. there are lots of thank yous coming through, which is great. And I, and oh, I would encourage you. everyone, please stay on and do the little survey that comes up at the end of the, um, the webinar. But Denise also makes a really good point. We are recording this session and Sue is happy for it to be on our webinar library. So I would encourage everyone to review it again. Go back over the information mm -hmm. with your handouts beside you so you can mark and say, yep, that was the one that I thought sounded really good. I'll go and talk to my physio mm -hmm. or I'll talk to my OT or I'll talk to my GP. But for, for every every program that we have, we hope there's there's almost like too many things to follow up because we want, we want to be giving <laughs> you solutions and ideas and encouragement so that you are living really well, despite what MS might be bringing in terms of discomfort and particularly around sleep today. Thanks, Sue, Thank and you. thanks everyone for being online. Please do the little survey mm -hmm. for us so we know if there are other topics you'd like as well. Thanks everyone, we'll Thank see you at the next program.
Bye-bye.